This video is the start of a series that we're doing about funeral practices around the world. In this video, we're heading over to Russia to see how their turbulent history has shaped the way current citizens mourn the dead and implement their funeral practices. If you find this video interesting, please give us a like and consider subscribing. We post death-related videos every Friday. Now let's talk Russian funeral practices. Population First up, a few statistics so we're all on the same page. Russia has a population of around 147 million people and the average life expectancy is 66 for males and 76 for females, which is considered rather low nowadays. The country has over 193 ethnic groups with 71% of those being ethnic Russians. 70% of Russians consider themselves to be Orthodox Christians. And Russia, like many countries, has an aging population problem combined with a declining birth rate. Now, with 193 ethnicities, there is no way we could do one video on all of their funeral practices. So we're narrowing down the focus to the majority of the population who are ethnic Russian, Orthodox, and middle to lower class. And it shouldn't need to be said, but remember, while Moscow and St. Petersburg may be the first thing that comes to mind when we think of Russia, and most photos are taken from there, keep in mind the majority of the population don't live in these two bright modern cities that Putin wants you to see. Now, Onwards to history. History. We are starting our Russian funeral history in the 1700s. We could go back further, but this is the time period that helps us start telling the story of current day funeral practices in the country. See, back then, parishes of the Orthodox Church managed funerals and funeral infrastructure throughout Russia. It was a very religious time, and in order to go to heaven, the dead needed to be buried on church grounds. Graveyards located on church grounds were about two to three acres in size and usually very overcrowded and poorly maintained, much like the rest of Europe's graveyards at the time. Graveyards were a money maker for the church and the dead didn't complain and the living couldn't question the authority of the church. Moving into the 1800s, church graveyards were still most commonly used, but some new cemeteries were developed in major cities and started to include places for nobles and clergy to be buried, and some upper classes preferred to be buried in these specific cemeteries. However, these cemeteries were still very religious and conservative, unlike the secular cemeteries, cemetery gardens, and natural necropolises that were being developed in a lot of other European countries at the time, such as Highgate Cemetery in London. Because of this lack of development, graveyards were still hugely overcrowded. Only in 1889 did the law of medical regulation come into effect to regulate cemeteries and graveyards to a sanitary standard. But the church still arranged funerals and managed the cemeteries, including the digging of graves on the principle of moral economy. However, there were opportunities for the use of private funeral services, including the production and sale of coffins and funeral hardware. But this really was only for the rich in the cities, of which there were few. Also, until 1900, burials were only recorded in the church records, and most churchyards contained no memorial signs or just simple wooden crosses, and burial plots were only maintained for up to 100 years before the grave was reused. So, in summary, up to this point, cemeteries and funerals were being run by the church and were maintained very poorly. And then, as we all know, the Tsar was overthrown and the life of the USSR began in 1917. The new government went about secularization and nationalization of private property. And one of the first decrees put in place was the About Land Decree in October of that year. This transferred all monastery and church lands to the management of the Soviet peasants' deputies, i.e. the government. And because cemeteries were part of church lands, they effectively nationalized under this decree. Any payments for graves were cancelled, and the Soviet people could now be buried in any cemetery they wished, not just in their own parishes. In December of 1918, the On Cemeteries and Funerals Decree was passed which abolished the ranks of burial, like putting high nobles in the best private cemeteries. And the Orthodox Church and private funeral companies, of which there were really only a handful, were removed from funeral affairs and these were allocated to local councils. These companies were then nationalized in February of 1919. In a nutshell, the Soviets had established a state monopoly by banning private funeral business along with every other kind of private business. Now, all this doesn't sound so bad until we tell you that they didn't supply any resources, neither financial or human, to local councils to maintain the infrastructure. 
Throughout the Civil War of 1917 to 1922, bodies piled up and with the absence of logistics and supplies like coffins, vehicles, horses, shovels, grave diggers, crowbars, it made it impossible to bury the dead. In the summer, when the ground had thawed out, bodies were buried in mass graves with no ritual. By that point, every cemetery in the large cities was way past overcrowded and they were entirely unusable. And yet, by 1930, the State Department said that every city, except for Moscow, should have only one cemetery. The rest were looted and the Soviet elite built houses on top of old cemeteries as well as old church lands, including graveyards. Remember, the Soviets, in theory, were not okay with religion, and they saw getting rid of cemeteries as getting rid of the church. The state at this time saw burial as traditional, and it was tradition that was holding them back. Cremation was progress, they said. Newspapers ran articles glorifying cremation as the new, and most crucially, ideologically correct way to conduct a funeral of a Soviet man. However, despite their efforts, Soviet citizens wouldn't budge on the issue, and by the mid-1930s, the state gave up on it. But it was the aftermath of their loss in World War II that had serious impact on the culture of death in the USSR. Every family had suffered at least one loss in their family. Every family was in mourning. But the war had destroyed housing, sewage, and social infrastructure and the destroyed cemeteries and morgues were just not of high priority compared to that. And in burying their dead, citizens couldn't purchase coffins or anything they needed for a funeral because the living were trying to put the cities back together. So burial effectively became DIY, and anything that was needed to do so was improvised, and that included the land for burial. Things got slightly better by the time the 1970s rolled around. The state had allowed a small amount of business to exist in the cities to provide funeral products like coffins, wreaths, and tombstones, but these were notably of low quality. But the local councils still maintained rights and responsibilities over the cemeteries, and they had no funding to maintain them. This not only means that they didn't look pretty, nor were they sanitary, but there was no system in place to know the location or number of burials in any cemetery. And to this day, those numbers are unknown. But that is just the state of the cemeteries. The people during Soviet time had gone through multiple wars, famine, and purges under Stalin. Every family had lost at least one member. Most families had lost more. But to the state, their grief was of no importance. Previously, families observed two-week mourning periods with multiple funeral rituals. But within four six-day work weeks under the threat of death, there just wasn't time for that. And that went on for generation after generation. The country's ability to be one with death was obliterated by the Soviet government, and the only way to get through was to ignore that death was happening, no matter if it was a close relative or not. And these habits continue to this day. Big changes occurred when the USSR collapsed in 1991, and private enterprise was allowed once again, meaning funeral companies developed and did so quite freely. This worked out relatively well until the licensing system was cancelled in 2001. While it didn't have much of an effect on large cities, medium and small towns were inundated with competition and corruption, and an effective ending of all legislation on funerals. This was further complicated by the sanctions against Russia in 2014 after the annexation of Crimea, and suddenly getting funeral supplies into Russia was incredibly difficult and costly. In today's Russia, there is no state regulation on funeral companies, and no one knows how many exist or how many people work in the area. You do not need training of any kind to be part of the industry, and the funeral industry in Russia is notorious for organized crime. As far as the cemeteries go, local authorities still technically have the responsibility of cemeteries around Russia, but they are neither publicly nor privately owned. When the USSR collapsed, these councils found themselves unknowingly inheriting thousands of illegal cemeteries that were created during Soviet times, due to the DIY nature burial took back then, and now they all need to be legalized and maintained. And many councils are reluctant to do so. Russian law states that every citizen is entitled to a free burial, so no money is coming in from there. Neither is it coming in from federal funding. Government departments on all levels do not want cemeteries to deal with on their books. Indeed, with the exceptions of the five major cities in Russia, criminal groups are commonly the ones that maintain and organize local cemeteries nowadays.
Furthermore, the Russian funeral industry doesn't offer newer developments like green burial, eco-funerals or ash disposal because there is very limited demand by the public, they say. Traditional burial is still very much what Russian citizens seem to prefer, though cremation is widely available. Cryonics is even available by the Cryorus company since 2006. And if you're unsure what cryonics entails, we have a video in the description. Death in Russia it is estimated that 50 to 53 percent of Russians will die at home, which is a much higher statistic than here in Australia or most of Europe. It is reported that this is because hospitals in Russia are ill-equipped and often send seriously ill patients home so as not to spoil their mortality statistics and thus whatever little funding they do get. The country's healthcare reform of 2010 to 2012 led to a reduction in beds. Nursing homes are poorly developed and there's only 73 hospices in all of Russia. If a person dies in hospital, family members are generally not in attendance according to hospital rules and ICU units remain closed to visitors. There really is a whole video that could be done on the Russian healthcare system. Upon death, it is common for funeral directors and agents to be informally told of the death and the first one to the family's door effectively gets the case. Almost immediately, the family will go with the funeral director to pick a coffin and wooden cross. They will not see the deceased until the funeral. The family will bring clothing for the deceased to the morgue and the funeral team will wash the body, do makeup and hair and put the body in the casket. By law, these services should be free, but many funeral workers demand an informal fee to do so. And as a side note, embalming is not practiced in Russia, which is a little ironic when you think of Lenin's body. The funeral takes place three days after death. It is common to cover mirrors with black cloth and not to play music in the house of the deceased. A photograph of the deceased is prominently displayed along with candles, a glass of vodka, black bread and flowers. During the funeral, which could take place at a morgue or church, the deceased coffin is opened and placed centrally in the room and everyone takes turns passing by and kissing the deceased. A service is held before only close family members accompany the deceased to the gravesite. After the burial of the deceased, an important part of Russian funerals is the farewell dinner. This has no connection to the funeral director and is done personally by the family at the home or a cafe. The menu must include pancakes, rice with honey, jelly and cabbage soup, all of which have symbolic meaning and are intended to celebrate eternal life. It is not until a year after burial that the tombstone is selected and installed, often of concrete, granite or marble. This is part of the funeral practice, along with annual days of mourning and remembrance involving visiting the deceased grave. In many ways, Russia has a conservative culture with a traditional family vibe, or at least Putin would like it to be. But because of its turbulent past, Russia's fuel infrastructure is sorely lacking and often corrupt. The Russian people still struggle to mourn the loss of their loved ones due to lack of funding of hospitals, morgues and cemeteries, and will continue to do so as it struggles with an aging population, high levels of drug and alcohol addiction and suicide, mixed with a sweep it under the rug kind of attitude by all levels of the government. But the Russian people have survived worse and their faith keeps them moving forward, hopefully to a more positive future. If you would like to know more about Russian funeral practices, I highly recommend this book here by Sergei Mokhov and details will be in the description. And with that, let us know in the comments which country you would like us to look at next. And now, go talk death.